Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. The Rhine, the great artery feeding the heart of Europe. This is a river which has changed the course of history. It has both united and divided Europe's people. On the one hand, the Rhine is a vital trade route, connecting countries and cultures on its 1,300 kilometer journey from source to sea. On the other hand, it's a barrier between nations, a border to be crossed. Throughout history, the Rhine has known bloody battles and heard the wail of war. But today, this river and its people are fighting a new battle against the effects of climate change. For as the world warms up, the Alpine glacier which feeds the river is melting fast. In less than a century, the source of the Rhine could shrink to nothing. The mighty waters might cease to flow, and the lives of the people and countries who share the Rhine could be changed forever. The Netherlands, Germany, France, Liechtenstein, Austria, and Switzerland. Six countries touched the banks of the Rhine. But for most of its length, this is a German river. The Rhine has long been a key to German identity. Patriotic monuments stand all along its banks. In the course of its journey, the Rhine passes through castle-rich gorges, alive with myth and fantasy, and immortalized in the music of Richard Wagner. Those same legends, twisted in the name of nationalism and racism, were a sinister theme in the dreadful violence of World War II. Those terrible days are long gone. But now another war is being waged on the Rhine, a fight against time. For as the glaciers which feed the Rhine continue to shrink, there is a real danger that the source of the river will dry up completely. The people who live and farm in the mountains right next to the glacial source are acutely aware of this impending threat. <laughs> My father always used to say that he took 10 minutes to walk from the village to the glacier. And now these days you can walk for three hours and you're still not at the glacier. <laughs> As global warming takes its toll, the future of Europe's busiest and most important river is endangered like never before.
The Rhine has two glacial sources high in the Swiss Alps. After their tumultuous descent through the mountains, these two waterways join to form Europe's most iconic river. Flowing through the vineyards of France along the spectacular Rhine Gorge and through Germany's industrial heart, the Rhine travels through the Netherlands before finally reaching the sea at Rotterdam. Stretching over 40 kilometers of waterfront, Rotterdam is one of the busiest ports on earth. The Rhine Delta is crucial to the economic success of Europe. Over 400 million tons of cargo pass through here every year. This is where the Rhine flows into the North Sea, where great vessels loaded with goods leave Europe and head for the rest of the world. To keep the massive volume of traffic flowing, 300,000 people are employed at the port. Practically everything here is computer controlled. Even the ships navigate by radar. Strangely serene picture, disaster is never far away. For Rotterdam is more than just a transit port. It's a massive industrial complex and the most important petrochemical site in the world. This is a very volatile place. Thousands of tons of raw industrial materials are refined into commercial products here with massive containers of flammable liquids and explosive chemicals lining the riverbank, fire is always just a spark away. When disaster strikes, specialist firemen like Alex Truman are the Rhine's first and only line of defense. For me, anyway, it's a way of life. Absolutely. It's irresistible. It's in the blood. My father is in the fire service, my brother too. With me, it's definitely in the blood. It's a dangerous career choice. With every fire that Alex attends, the risk of explosion is huge, as more than half of all goods which pass through this port contain dangerous cargo. What's more, the ferocious heat of the flames could release toxic chemicals into the atmosphere, poisoning the environment and the half a million residents of nearby Rotterdam city. Alex and his family are among them. If you stopped to think about it, you'd be worried about the dangerous things that could happen. The moment you focus on what could go wrong, you would not be able to sleep. Alex's skills are so specialized that companies from all over Europe send their staff to be taught by his team at the port's disaster training area. This complex even includes a grounded tanker that's set on fire several times a day, so trainees can practice how to respond to industrial accidents. Yet the danger on their doorstep seems to go unnoticed by the majority of people in Rotterdam. I think a lot of people see what is happening around them, but they don't stop to think things could go wrong. They don't even know what could go wrong. Perhaps they just don't want to think about it. Many of these people are employed at the port. Without this dangerous industry, there would be no jobs. But the Rhine has always been more than just an economic lifeline. It's a river which feeds culture, 
and tradition. Before they learned to control the river, fishermen would tell of Rhine maidens, goblins, and other mysterious creatures which they believed lived beneath the treacherous waters. Today, these fishermen's tales have become folklore, and the dangerous waters that inspired the legends have been tamed, transformed into a placid waterway for industry. But it's this industry which has nearly killed off the only way of life the fishermen of the Rhine have ever known. One man who still trawls the waters is Wilken Den Boer. Even though he has a degree in mechanical engineering, Wilken decided to follow in the family tradition of fishing for a living. Like his uncle and grandfather before him, he specializes in catching eels, a popular delicacy in this area of the Netherlands. The eels come from the Sargasso Sea, near Cuba. They arrive here in the river estuary. They swim upriver, grow and mature until they're ready to spawn. And then they make their way back to the Sargasso Sea, where they reproduce. But some 30 years ago, a good catch like this would have been unthinkable, because of the vast amounts of pollution in the river. Wilken remembers the difficult times his grandfather experienced. Pollution definitely affected fish stocks. Certainly in the 60s there were fewer eels in the river. For Wilken, 1986 was a particularly bad year. Just a few months after he became a professional fisherman, a chemical factory upstream of Rotterdam port exploded, spewing toxic fertilizer into the waters. The river turned red, and nearly all the fish perished. Wilken realized then that his livelihood was in danger. Today, he's one of only six fishermen left to ply their trade among the massive tankers and cargo ships in Rotterdam port. But the tide of fortune may be changing, as the authorities have recently made a concerted effort to clean up the waters. In the last few years, we've seen much more salmon. They'd virtually died out due to pollution. In the 50s and 60s, we hardly caught any. But in recent years, we've started to catch a few hundred a year again. As the fish return to the Rhine, Wilken hopes that one day his sons will join him and carry on the family tradition. Further upstream, however, the Rhine and its people share a more painful legacy. One of suffering, tyranny, and war. At the eastern edge of the Netherlands, near the border with Germany, the Rhine forms a natural boundary between the two countries, a frontier to be breached. This is a river that has heard the feet of marching armies and the thunder of bombs. Never was the wail of war louder for the Rhine than during World War II. As the Allies advanced, Adolf Hitler used the river as the last line of defense to protect Germany and the Nazi-occupied territories. Caught up in the heavy crossfire were the people living along the Rhine's banks. Tanno Petersee was only 12 when the Germans first occupied the Dutch town of Arnhem. He remembers growing up in an atmosphere of fear and suspicion, where you looked over your shoulder before talking to your neighbor. The occupation had all kinds of unpleasant consequences for our country. Persecution, concentration camps, murder and death. Then in September 1944, the British hatched a plan codenamed Operation Market Garden to try and bring the war to a rapid end. Through the large-scale use of airborne forces, the Allies hoped to capture several vital bridges, including this one at Arnhem, allowing them to advance into the heart of Germany. 
But Operation Market Garden was a terrible failure. Arnhem turned out to be a bridge too far, but we did not know that then. Because it took three days to drop 30,000 paratroopers, the British lost more than just the element of surprise. Thousands of Allied soldiers were killed, most never even reaching the bridge. Others took refuge in people's homes, only to be tracked down and shot. The Germans started burning houses they suspected of harboring British soldiers. A dedicated member of the Red Cross, Tanno was undeterred by the threats. When we arrived, they said, you were lucky, you've just driven through the front line. But yes, so what? Nothing happened, that was my performance during the Battle of Arnhem, simply fetching food for those people who had fled their burning homes. It was to be another nine months before the Allies would succeed in crossing the Rhine and the war would finally end. Today, for veterans like Tanno Petersi, the bridge at Arnhem stands as a proud tribute to their heritage and to the fight to protect their liberty and their homes. For some, however, home and a familiar way of life are not defined by a single place. Home is the river itself. For hundreds of years, these cargo barges have moved in procession up and down the Rhine piloted by the families who own them and who live on board. Herr Veldman and his wife both come from a family of Rhine barge owners who make their living transporting goods up and down the river. They've grown up on the water. From they have been 84. We've been sailing together since 1984, me and my wife Ria. We started on a smaller ship of 700 ton. After that, we had a ship built of 1500 ton. And this one is five years old and is 3000 ton. We sail nearly continuously, 18 hours, 17 or 16, depending on how much time you have and where you're going. Though they do have a home on dry land in the Netherlands, where the children go to school, they spend a great deal of their life afloat, in some comfort. OK, this is the kitchen. Here we have our meals at lunchtime and in the evening. This is the oven and electrical things like the microwave, the fridge and the freezer. This is the living room. This is the table that we eat at when we have family and friends over. The lounge and our son Stefan. This is where we relax, the television, and this is our eldest son's bedroom. As they journey along the river, barge families witness firsthand the ever changing history of the Rhine and the land through which it travels. Leaving the Netherlands, the Veldmans cross the border into Germany and towards Duisburg, a town steeped in its industrial past. Strategically positioned at the confluence where the Rhine meets the river Ruhr, it was here that the fat seams of coal and iron ore mined from the river valleys came together to be processed into steel. In the 19th century, Duisburg was a boom town and the largest inland port in the world. Over half a million people were employed here in the dirty and dangerous heavy industries. Steel made in Duisburg could be sailed downriver and exported directly to sea. Today, the workings of the old industrial powerhouse are rusting away. Coal and iron are no longer the backbone of the local economy and Duisburg is shaking off the shackles of its polluted industrial past. Instead of belching out poisonous gases, this enormous old steel plant has been converted into a leisure facility. 
the old gasometer has become a scuba diving school. Nothing much is produced in Duisburg anymore, but it's still a thriving center of trade. This marks the last point inland along which the Rhine can receive ocean-going vessels. At Duisburg, large ships must transfer their goods onto smaller boats and vice versa. It's in this transfer and trading of cargo that the city makes its money. The Veldman's barge is just one of 20,000 cargo vessels which pass through Duisburg every year. When they reach port, they'll unload the steel which they're carrying. Frau Veldman will take their Jaguar off the deck and drive back to the Netherlands, while her husband retraces their journey with a different load. In times gone by, however, people would have dismissed the notion of free trade along the Rhine as nonsense. Upstream of Duisburg, the French and Germans in particular pushed and pulled over the right to control this valuable trade route. The river town of Koblenz has a long history of disputed ownership. This confluence of the French river Moselle and the mighty Rhine has changed hands between France and Germany several times over in the last thousand years. Now the headland that defines the river junction has been declared proudly German. Known as Deutsches Eck, the German corner, this popular tourist attraction is actually a celebration of the legacy of one man, Emperor Wilhelm I. At the end of the 19th century, Wilhelm was heralded the first emperor of Germany. He unified all the previously disparate German states into one powerful force, a force that was to be used and misused in the name of German nationalism. Today, the politics of old Europe are consigned to the past, and it's left to the tourists, German and international alike, to appreciate the statue for what it really is, a beautiful monument. But Deutsches Eck is not the end of Wilhelm's legacy to Germany and to Europe. He and his government were instrumental in the early straightening of the Rhine River Channel. In the early 1800s, the river was known as the Wild Rhine, with numerous channels and hundreds of islands. The constant rise and fall of the water was flooding villages and valuable fertile lands. So, as part of a scheme to control the river, Wilhelm and his government implemented a rigorous process of straightening the Rhine. Two hundred years later, and today the banks of the river have been dramatically transformed from a network of smaller waterways into a single large one, effectively a canal cutting through Europe. This new, deeper, wider river has enabled boats from across the continent to come together and share goods and cultures. But this free trade facilitates the passage of more than just barges and their load. For as ships pass more freely through the waterways, they carry an unwelcome and potentially lethal cargo. A lot of ships carry ballast to keep the ships balanced. As they are traveling through foreign countries, they draw and release water to regulate that balance depending on how heavily laden they are, transporting river creatures with them. For Dr. Stefan Nehring, checking on the creatures that live in and around the Rhine is a favorite hobby. What began as a childhood fascination with the river has led to a career as a marine biologist. And the things he's finding among the stones are worrying him. 
Interessant ist es hier im Rhein unter den Steinen nach. It is very interesting looking at what can be found under these stones on the banks of the Rhine. Quite a few creatures live here. We see a little shrimp. This is a crustacean which comes from the Black Sea and came to the Rhine over the Main Danube Canal. It's a predator and it loves eating the other shrimps which are indigenous to this region. And that's why it's called in the science world the killer shrimp. Heutzutage als killer shrimp bezeichnet. The numbers of these tiny yet deadly killer shrimp have increased steadily as the map of Europe has changed. Its natural home is in fact the Black Sea region. But in the 1980s this creature traveled along the Danube and was found in Germany for the first time in 1991. We think that this happened because the Eastern Bloc countries opened themselves up to the West and that led to an increase in the movement of shipping on the Danube. But the killer shrimp's voracious appetite has caused the extinction of many native species. And it's impossible to turn back the clock. Exotic and foreign creatures never become indigenous. They are always considered to be exotic and are a threat to the local plants and wildlife. Either they eat them or they all adapt and then they become exactly the same as each other. And that's what's called the McDonaldization of the environment. Further upstream, the Rhine hosts a different kind of foreign traveller. popular tourist destination, this German stretch of river is known as the Romantic Rhine and is steeped in myth and legend. A highlight of the tourist trail is here at Lorelei Rock. Made famous in the folklore, the story goes that a young maiden, betrayed by her philandering fiancé, falls to her death. From her watery grave, she lures unsuspecting sailors who, bewitched by her beauty, take their eyes off the task of navigating the most treacherous stretch of the Rhine and perish. The folk story of the Rhine Maiden of the Lorelei echoes a historical truth. The Rhine here has always been a very difficult stretch of river to navigate. The rocks are close to the surface, and shifting currents draw unsophisticated craft into dangerous waters. Many sailors have lost their lives. This isn't the only folklore which connects the waters of the Rhine with quintessential German myths. The story of a hoard of gold, said to be stolen from three other Rhine maidens, is what inspired Richard Wagner to compose his famous operatic cycle, the Ring of the Nibelung. The Rhine Maiden's legendary beauty was to become a blueprint for the Aryan ideal of a blonde and blue-eyed race. An ideal used as a propaganda tool for Hitler's brutal regime and the terrible persecutions carried out in the name of racial purity. This is the oldest Jewish cemetery in Germany. All the graves here date back to before World War II. And they tell a tale of a large and successful community. This is Heiliger Sands in the river city of Worms. There are some Jews living in Worms today, but these are recent Russian immigrants. The German Jews who'd made Worms their home since medieval times were, quite simply, wiped out. On November the 9th, 1938, 
the Nazis unleashed a wave of violence against Germany's Jews. In the space of a few hours, thousands of synagogues and Jewish businesses and homes were damaged or destroyed. This was called, chillingly, Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht means night of glass and refers to the shattered window panes that carpeted the streets. But it also commemorates the shattered lives of those Jews living in Germany during World War II. More than 70 years later, and people of all faiths and cultures are living and working in the streets of Worms once more. These old cobbles echo with the sound of new life. It's a multiculturalism that is reflected in communities up and down the Rhine, as people from many nations were invited to work in Germany during the post-war reconstruction. The largest group of foreign residents came from Turkey. Hasan Ozdemir is a Turkish author and poet who arrived in Germany as a 16-year-old and never went home. Hasan is one of an estimated 1.7 million Turkish immigrants in Germany. He lives here in Ludwigshafen, a few miles upriver from Worms. In the latter half of the 20th century, this city grew rapidly as Turkish immigrants flooded in to plug the acute labor shortage caused by World War II. At first, these migrants were to be guest workers, coming to work for a limited period of time only. Men arrived without their families and took poorly paid factory jobs, considered too dangerous or too dirty for German workers. But increasingly, the immigrants sent for their wives and children and settled in small communities across Germany. It was a difficult process of integration. In the early years, tensions flared between the Turks and Germans. Today, the immigrants have created a home from home in the inner city areas. Many of today's Turks living in Germany now consider themselves first-generation Germans. The term Gastarbeiter, that is foreigner, is a term I reject completely. You just shouldn't call immigrants that anymore, because now they are a big part of the society here. We can't imagine Germany without immigrants now. Germany has changed completely. And there is a new generation growing up here who have taken on a responsibility to this country. And because of that, they should be called Germans. And when you speak of foreigners, then you should consider Germans too as foreigners because they don't know the real Germany anymore. As the old prejudices are fading, the atmosphere in this river town now is more about acceptance and tolerance. A new mosque has been built in Ludwigshafen, and people of all faiths are welcome here. They even encourage school trips to visit and to learn about Islam. It's an openness that's encouraged Hassan to embrace his new way of life. Now, this Turkish poet, inspired by a river, writes all his work in German. Now, the Rhine is a very important element to me, from a literary standpoint too. To me, the Rhine is a symbol of movement. The river flows, and I can describe the river like an immigrant. The river separates the countries, coming between people as it flows through towns, etc. 
the river is on a continuous journey and as it changes it flows and in changing it gathers strength and flows faster all the time Upstream of Ludwigshafen, the river that is Hassan's creative inspiration continues to change. This time from a German to a French river. Here, the waters also form a natural and long disputed boundary between nations, with French Alsace-Lorraine on one side and the German Black Forest on the other. The Rhine now divides the two countries that have pushed and pulled over its banks for hundreds of years. It's the communities in this region that have had to face the consequences. Originally French citizens, the Alsatian people became Prussians following the Franco-Prussian War of the 19th century. Fifty years later, following the First World War, they became French again. Jean Hugel's family have been wine growers in Rickveer, in the region of Alsace, for nearly 400 years, and they've personally felt the tug of two nations fighting for their loyalty. My grandfather was born a Frenchman in 1869, but became a Prussian in 1871. 1918, he was French again, and during the war, the Nazis took Alsace with an iron fist and attacked us. So we had to become Hitler supporters, not the real us, but in appearance. My grandfather died a Frenchman again in 1950. Seems very strange, all this changing of nationality, but it was one big family drama at the time. We were always in the wrong army, always on the losing side. When you put the Alsatians into an army, it's the one that loses. And after that, we are back with the winners again. It's a complicated story, but at least it's made us into proper Europeans. Although living next door to the Rhine brought a major identity crisis, it's also brought a lot of wealth to the family wine business. From here, we have a great view of the vineyards of Alsace. To the right, the Vosges, the Rhine Plain, and the Rhine River a little further away, not too close. It would be dangerous. And then there is the Black Forest. And from the point of view of the river, it is the most southerly point of the river where the water goes north. So it's ideally placed for the business of exporting wine. Jean Huguel and the other vineyard owners in Alsace export most of their wine directly down the Rhine to other parts of Europe and the world. Pour gagner de l'argent dans le monde du vin, to make money in the wine business, you need to sell the product to people who have money, but no wine themselves. And for us, those people are in Northern Europe. Because of the Rhine, we can share our wine with people in the lower lands. If you drop a cork in the river here, it will reach the end of its journey in Rotterdam. Despite having to change their nationality several times, Jean Huguel's family have survived as winemakers against all odds. But their future depends on the survival of the Rhine, and the river is under threat. Not only from the melting of its source high in the Swiss Alps, but from pollution too. Further upriver, the Rhine crosses the border of a fourth country, Switzerland, which is also home to the twin sources of the Rhine, the Vorder and Hinterrhine rivers. As a landlocked country, the river is central to Switzerland's economic success. Marking this junction where the Rhine enters Switzerland is the Swiss-German city of Baal, 
a wealthy center of commerce established on the proceeds of specialty chemical and drug industries. But for the river and the people of Baal, success has come at a price. Irene Vigor has lived in Baal all her life. 1986 is a year which she remembers all too vividly. It was in this year that a fire engulfed a riverside factory, causing a disastrous chemical spill which turned the Rhine red. Downstream, as far as Rotterdam, the pollution killed wildlife and devastated the Rhine fishing industry. In Baal, where it all began, the poison also hung in the air. I remember it well. It was the middle of the night when we heard the sirens and we were warned to close our windows. There was a smell in the air. It was like rotten eggs. That was the start of pollution, which lasted for years, until the water and the air was clean again. Extra special care is taken to test the purity of the water in the river these days. That's the work of these scientists in the Rhine Water Quality Monitoring Station. This water contains the effluent of 600,000 people. It's now drinkable when boiled. That's quite a boast. Things are better now. And there are provisions in place that should prevent the same thing happening again. But one sees it somehow like powder in the barrel of a gun. Today in Baal, there's a real determination to protect the Rhine from the ill effects of development. But there's also a real desire to preserve the industrial heritage which has brought such wealth to the city. Irene is one of the leaders of a community project which aims to do both. We live in the area and we love the old factories and we decided to try and create a cultural meeting point for the community. This old machine factory belonged to a world famous company but they moved out because there wasn't enough room to expand and they just left the building empty. We thought it would be a good idea to bring new life to the place for the sake of the community. With a library, a restaurant and even a circus skills school, this is now a place for the whole community and the Rhine is at its heart. This centre is some distance away from the Rhine and at the beginning we were criticised because it was not in the centre of town. But I think that even here you feel the flow of the Rhine. From source to sea, the Rhine and its mighty waters shape the lives of all those who live on the riverbank. But what happens if the flow of the Great Rhine is reduced as its source melts and eventually dries up completely? It's a sobering thought that these magnificent Rhine waterfalls, the largest in Europe, could be reduced to slow-moving waters. Approximately 700 cubic meters of water pour over these rocks every second, depending on the time of year. In the summer, the Rhine's glacial source melts more quickly, and so the water flows more powerfully. But as our climate changes, the seasons are merging into each other, and the ice is melting throughout the year. If the world continues to get warmer, the glacier will eventually disappear and the Great Rhine could become nothing more than a stream. Everything about the river will change. 
its physical presence and its vital role in the lives of individuals and countries. The journey to the twin sources of the Rhine climbs through some of the most spectacular and dramatic landscapes on the continent. Steep rocks line both sides of this narrow valley, where the Rhine is no longer a navigable waterway. This is the Rhinealta, also known as the Rhine Grand Canyon, and it leads to the secondary source of the Great Rhine. This small frozen lake is the source of the Vorderrhein. But the major birthplace of the Rhine is the Rheinwalden Glacier, affectionately named Paradise, after an ancient folk tale. It's here that the threat to the river becomes all too clear. Passed down from generation to generation, the folk tale tells of a poor farmer who lived in this valley, whose only possession was a tiny field on top of the Alps, called Paradise. A greedy neighbor stole the land, but Mother Nature cast her spell, and in the morning, the field was hidden under a thick blanket of ice, forming the Rheinwalden Glacier and the source of the Rhine. Today, this little paradise is under threat once more. The glaciers lost a quarter of its volume in just 25 years. Herr and Frau Lorez have lived and farmed in Hinterrhein, beneath the glacier, all their lives. It's common land on top of the mountain. Everybody owns the land. Yes, the whole village owns it. And then there's a shepherd up there. We share him. We all share him. And so we don't have to worry too much as long as everyone understands each other and we don't quarrel. When there is a disagreement, it's difficult. And everyone has to negotiate. You don't need to be an environmental expert to notice the shrinking of the glacier in Hinterrhein. The people here know that their environment is changing fast. My father always used to say that it took 10 minutes to walk from the village to the glacier. And now these days you can walk for three hours and you're still not at the glacier. <laughs> and when my father used to say that, it was only in the 1920s. Before when it rained, it all stayed on the mountain. But now it all comes sliding down and there's a danger of avalanche. And it keeps on coming in a strong flow then, for a week. And then the whole thing stops again. That's the difference, for sure. And if the glacier thaws to nothing, the effects could be just as terrible. The drinking water in the village comes from a very good source. But if there's nothing flowing down, it'd be like a desert here. <laughs> As the relentless melting of the glacier continues, the Rhine and the lives of all those who depend on it are in danger. If the source of the river runs dry, what then for the farmers and the fishermen, the countries and their boundaries, the communities and their culture?
If the course of the river is changed forever, life in this part of the world will be unrecognizable. The Rhine is a river of stunning beauty and great historical importance. These waters power the economy of Europe. Since time immemorial, the river has served many lands and peoples, from those who live near it to those who live thousands of miles away. People have fought to own the Rhine and the land on its banks. Perhaps the time has come for those people to unite to save the river and to fight side by side for its future. <laughs>